I'm standing beside the grave of my great, great, great grandmother, Esther Roberts, who married Alexander Lang. She is buried in the churchyard at St John's Catholic Church at Richmond. She was charged with housebreaking and transported on the Gilmore to Sydney. From Sydney, she came to Van Diemen's Land on the Emu, the same ship that transported Alexander Lang to Van Diemen's Land. After they married, they had nine children and I'm descended from Emily, who is the eighth child. Emily is buried in the Fawcett Cemetery with other descendants. You know that he was a convict who was transported in 1813, got to Van Diemen's Land in 1815. He'd been a member of the 92nd Gordon Highlanders, had got drunk in a pub in Perth, Perthshire and uh, stole some money to buy some more grog, which was his problem all his life. First of all, I'd like to tell you a little bit about Lang and the, the way it, the tunes were discovered in the in the archives, uh, the the man Lang when he lost his job at New Norfolk in 1863, he came back here and and had to live with his married daughter Reardon's up at uh, Green Hills where we're also going later today, and um, there he drafted this manuscript dedicated to Robert Rowlands, and it had been in the archives. The, some of the family knew about it, but. No one who was in the sort of folk crowd had ever got it out and just thought to actually play them. And I knew Steve and Marjorie Gadd at the time they were taking lessons in my brother Andy McPhee's music shop. So I photocopied some co uh, pages and went along and they had a bit of play and had a wonderful afternoon down at their house going through these Lang tunes as they were in the raw, handwritten in small, small handwriting. Um, 242 tunes all up, of which 65 were Tasmanian tunes. There are lots of tunes by other Goddess composers and uh, Robbie Burns and Alan Ramsey and others, as well as Anonymous. But there was this really interesting bunch of original tunes with tunes like Cyril Windmill and um, Richmond Lasses and Lady Franklin's Reel. So we were able to identify them according to where he worked and where he lived. He wrote uh, over 20 tunes for the Surreal District. We decided to sort of publish these tunes and the Gad, Steve Gad, retranscribed them onto a larger format stave and, and I wrote the history behind the dedications and the people, but grouping them around the areas where Langan lived and where the, the stories unfolded like we have today. So we produced the book and it was launched at the National Folk Festival in 2011 by Dave O'Neill from the Bushwhackers who had a preview copy and he's a good fiddler and a guitarist and he said at the time it was the most significant book in Australian folk music in 25 years. <laughs>
Thank you. So here we go with Gordon Street Sorrel. Is, relates to the story I was telling you down the street about Matthew Brady's raid and it's called Brady's Lookout in 1825 and it's not at all sombre and I think there was a secret admiration as the, amongst the wider colonial community for the daring do of Matthew Brady. People sort of knew each other so well, as we'll find out, that they intermarried a lot. Dodgers, Reardons, uh, and other families, and many of them are buried over here. We're not quite sure when exactly this school was built, the first part of it, because it, it sort of expanded in different phases. But the very first school seemed to be in the old watch house, the convict built watch house, which is on the other side of what's now Lewisham, behind the current pub. These are, these are some of the Lang tunes associated with the lower ferry area. <laughs> Thank you. 
the next one is Robert Doctor of Valley Field uh, and is a jig. <laughs> As a crossing point for the Lower Ferry, the locality attracted travellers and locals, offering an opportunity for publicans. As a result, the Lower Ferry was, had a colourful history of inns and innkeepers. After the Port Arthur was opened in 1830, the Lower Ferry crossing developed increased significance as a surveillance spot for escaped prisoners. This, this place seems to have been operating very early, at least from 1817, when there was a ferry recorded as crossing here. Now, whether the, the inn wasn't, as I mentioned, built to quite a little bit later, it was the centre of a mobile community. Court records which survive in the 1840s indicate social life, including the occupations and nicknames, nicknames used to refer to one another. A high, le high level of violence is also evident, as is resentment towards the ever-present constables. Many of the arrests involved alcohol and the life around the inns of the Lower Ferry. During this period, they had a number of publicans. Although it was owned by Thorne, it was leased by Joseph Dawson, then James Clark, and Samuel Isles.
These tunes relate to Alexander Lang's downturn and then the revival in his uh, life when he, as I mentioned earlier, lost his wife in 1842 and his mentor James Gordon died the same year and he hit the bottle big time. <laughs> James Gordon was a prominent figure in the local community and in the colonial days. And Lang was particularly close to him and his mentored him. And when he died, he went downhill very quickly.
Alexander Lang wrote two tunes referring to James Gordon. One is Gordon Street, Sorrell. The other is James Gordon, Fawcett, Tasmania, about his home. Gordon was the magistrate for the district and Lang was the district constable, charged many offenders with various offences from stock thieving, minor theft, to more serious ones of various murders and um, aggressive acts around the town. This is also where um, our friend Alexander died. And it always seems very poignant to me that this is where he wrote these terrific documents and yet he died here. With no headstone, no known exact place of burial. So we'll start off with this one of, from his New Norfolk Times, Miss Victoria Lang's birthday, 1851.
Was that Brady's lookout you just did? Yeah. Uh, you better do it again because Wayne wasn't here. Uh, <laughs> so, and it's one of it's Joe, one of Joe's favourite tunes as well. So, um, but as you as you know, he raided um, Sorrell in '25, but he actually had been involved in the raid up here in 1817 when Mike Howe and uh, Geary held up the place, and he noticed in the in the kitchen, a fiddle hanging under the mantelpiece in a green bag, which is how you stored fiddles in those days. Partly because it was near the fire and keep it dry you know, in a moist house. And um, they said to him, who's plays the fiddle? And so he was dobbed in and he had to get up on the table, play the fiddle while the gang raided the larder and got all the servants out of the quarters and helped themselves. Apparently, according to Lang, he didn't, they didn't drink any alcohol. And this was also in the newspapers. They, they didn't avoid the alcohol but gave it all to the servants. The other tune, one of the tunes I've, I've selected for this uh, last session, were well, all ones that we've done before during the day, except for this one, which was Tasmanian Waltz. And the, ma the manuscript was dated 1863, and Tasmania had only been Tasmania for less than 10 years. So it seemed to me, reading into it, that Lang saw himself as a Tasmanian, because that's what he's called it, Tasmanian Waltz, um, at a time when people were trying to hide their convict ancestry. So I think that's really quite telling. And it's a lovely sort of minuet, slow tune, so we'll play that now. Tasmanian Waltz. Very nice. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks to the Green Hill Gathering. And especially Joe, who's 
hasn't, I don't think, played exactly this sort of music before, but it's fitted in like a hand in a glove. On that cheerful note, we'll finish with... Richmond Lasses. Richmond Lasses. Right. When Esther Roberts Lang died in 1841, she left a family of nine children. Who reared the younger ones is uncertain, possibly Susanna, who was 18 at the time. We know where Esther is buried, but we don't know where Alexandra is buried, probably in one of the Anglican cemeteries at Sorel. <laughs>